Now, I, I can look forward to a life of uh, stealing babies in the middle of the night and uh, killing chickens, fearing full moons, dodging silver bullets. Well, thank you, Dad, but no thanks. Don't believe all that stuff you see in the movies. With certain obvious exceptions, werewolves are people just like anyone else. What I'm trying to say is the werewolf is a part of you, but that doesn't change what you have inside. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. Well, at least the weather's better today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is Rojan. Lobo. And today we have our big interview with Linda Godfrey, and uh, we're pretty mm-hmm. stoked about that. Yeah, a little bit. So what's up? How's things been in your part of town? The weather yeah, cooled off over there? Oh, yeah, right. It cooled off. I felt like I walked out into a pizza oven. I think we're around the 90 degree mark with humidity. I'm not sure. I've been in my pool marinating all day long. So Marinating? Pretty much I'm mm-hmm. good. <laughs> I make my own gravy under heat circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Roll. So, gravy. uh, yeah, <laughs> gravy train. Nice. So, yeah, we've got Linda on today. She's uh, she's one of the living legends in the uh, field of cryptozoology and paranormal in general. And mm. um, actually, as I sit here, I look over, I see my my weird Michigan book that she wrote. Nice. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard um, Linda was on Erie Radio when she was interviewed, and I I actually uh, wrote into the show about it and uh, one of the questions that we're going to be asking her tonight is hopefully you know going to be covered on that because we you know we couldn't get a chance to uh you know have a follow-up on the question that was asked so well, maybe i'll get my answer tonight you know it's it's really odd of all the people that i've interviewed and of all the stuff that i've done so far i am this is I, i'm actually nervous about this interview <laughs> so i'm not really sure why maybe it's because i haven't had the chance to speak with her ahead of time and i know she's a sweet lady and i know all that kind of stuff but it's kind of like this is one of those situations where you meet one of your heroes. I always say don't meet your heroes because they might not be what you want them to be. Why well, I think Linda's going to be exactly what I expect her to be, oh, but yeah. still it's kind of like it's kind of like you're waiting outside the concert backstage waiting for the band to come out and you're kind of like all nervous and stuff and you're handing them the autograph book with the pen shaking and everything. So <laughs> Moving on, let's uh let's get some business out of the way here real quick. Um right, right. We had an email come in from Scorpion King and I'll let you uh I'll let you read that because it's a really great email. All right, we got an email from uh, Scorpion King, those people that were involved with Erie Radio and uh, a few other ones. He's part of, of the family. He's he in, he's he's in the family of, of listeners. He is. He's my Miko. We've been friends for quite a while. We met up on uh, Erie. We've been talking since. So uh, this is from him. It says, hello to all the wonderful people out in Cyberland. I've recently started listening to this podcast, and to be honest, I was blown away. The fun and informative articles make me want more, and I have recently started listening to the back episodes. You guys have all the perfect mix of all the other podcasts I listen to. It's like someone took handfuls of Erie Radio, Paratopia, Transmissions from the Bunker, and ADHD, added a sprinkle of Mysterious Universe and the Crossroads podcast, and mixed it well. The result was Project Archivist podcast. Keep up the great work, and I hope to hear lots and lots more from you in the future. I'm especially looking forward to the Jeremy Vaney interview, since I am also a researcher in the ufology, and until recently had a website dedicated to UFOs, which was UFO Clearinghouse. That was Matt, that that was uh, Scorpion Kings. Yeah, UFO Clearinghouse is Scorpion Kings. Oh, I didn't know that. Say so, okay, gotta go. Have to get ready for my commute to work. Keep up the great work. And we'll send a few articles to you guys in the near future. Until then, be good. And if you can't be good, be fast. Scorpion King out! Yes, those are, uh, he got it right. Erie Radio, Paratopia, Transmissions. Those are all in our family of, of shows. So that's yeah. that's exactly what we were aiming for. Sprinkling a Mysterious Universe, Crossroads. That's that's exactly the direction that we, we've been trying to go. Aw, shucks. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> yeah, right. Love you, mijo. Yeah, we've uh, we've gotten a couple of really crazy reviews on iTunes, too. Did you see the one about the midget porn star? <laughs> yeah, gee, where did that come <laughs> <laughs> But hey, a win's a win. That's a five-star rating, and we'll take it. That is right. the best way to help us out on the show. Every time we get a good rating on there, it pushes us up on the ratings, which gets more people listening to us, which makes us grow, so on and so forth. Well, I guess we should get ready for our interview with Linda here. Woot woot. And uh, I guess we'll see you guys after the interview. Nice.
Okay, everybody. Today we are joined by Linda Godfrey. She is a paranormal writer out of Wisconsin, and she is definitely one of myself and Lobo's heroes. But we've we've ran it on and on about that for the last several weeks on the lead up to the show, which we have. We've really been looking forward to talking to you. It's um, I said before we went on the air, it was like going hanging out backstage at a concert, waiting for them to walk out with the autograph pen and paper. So we're very excited and very glad to have you here. You guys are all too kind, and I really appreciate it. I'm very honored and pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for saying yes. <laughs> totally. Oh, of course. Well, you're one of our heroes because you don't get caught up in the whole all of the um, all of the goop that goes along with what's in the paranormal world. You tend to stay above it. You're just not somebody that gets Thank bogged you. down with a lot of the stuff that's out there, and that's one of the reasons we really like you because you're a good investigator, and you just Thank hold you. yourself above all that. Well, I try to, you know, my, my motto is if you if you get down in the dirt, you're going to come up with some mud on your face, mm. <laughs> you know, so no matter what. So um, I, I really try to just stick to the facts, stick to my investigations, keep my reporter hat on that I started with in the beginning, mm -hmm. and I think that generally serves me pretty well. Tell us a little bit about yourself and so the listeners have an idea of who you are in case they haven't heard about you yet. Well, I started out working for a newspaper. I have my degree is in art and art education. I've also taught art in some public schools. They've actually allowed me to be around children. <laughs> and, I would love to have you as an art teacher. But I, oh, thank you. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I did. But I found myself working for this newspaper because I wanted to be a cartoonist. And lo and behold, one of the very first stories that I got was. The Beast of Bray Road. Nobody else would touch it, but I liked weird stories even then. This was back um, about almost 20 years ago, and I think those 10 years I spent at the newspaper before I finally decided to quit and start writing books because there was so much interest in The Beast of Bray Road continuing, you know, a, a decade after it had uh, last been reported, that I, I really felt that the story should be expanded upon and preserved and brought to the world in sort of a larger form. So I wanted to do that. And uh, I also wanted to get more involved in the web, which was just starting to be the thing that it is today, you know, at about that time. So um, I, I had this reporting and journalism background that really has helped me a lot, I think, in my investigations, um, both in terms of knowing how to investigate something, but also how to try and present a, a fair and balanced view. And really, in the end, what I try to do is present as much as I can and let people make up their own minds as to the true nature of what these things are, in lieu of a certifiable werewolf body, you know, which, yeah, which until I have that, I just feel intellectually dishonest declaring that I know what it is one way or the other. That's exactly why we wanted to have you here, actually. It's funny you should mention the Beast of Bray Road, because I was talking to you really briefly on Skype before you came on. I saw it on eBay for $69 today. So. The original first yeah, it's out. That book is now out of print. You can still get it on Kindle, I believe, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But um, the original book, with its all of its illustrations, and uh, some of them are pretty cool. They document Mick Fleetwood um, preparing to star in what would have been my version of the Beast of Bray Road, not the movie that's out there. Wait a minute, um, Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac? Yes. That's sick. <laughs> How'd you yeah, pull we, that off? He was completely signed up. We had him all set. Um, and it was going to be directed by Stephen Verona. Oh, cool. Um, and, yeah, and we had gone so far as I got to meet Mick backstage in Milwaukee, uh, along with one of TSRs, which is the people who created Dungeons & Dragons, one of their top mm -hmm. illustrators. Rob Rupel came along, did some photos, and then whipped up uh, a concept drawing of what Mick would look like with um, prosthetic makeup, you know, to make him look like a werewolf. And so that, both the original photo of Mick and that prosthetic um, imagination that, that Rob came up with are, are in that book. And you can't, of course, see those in, on the Kindle, as far as I know. So, um, yeah, so that book has a lot of cool stuff. And part of what I wanted to do with that first book was actually document all of the sociology, all of the psychology, the, the things uh, that went on in association with there being kind of a, a monster scare in a small town like Elkhorn, Wisconsin. And part of that was that this uh, Hollywood producer just happened to be flying through Wisconsin and, and picked up a newspaper and saw the story and called me. That's how the whole near movie 
myth came came about. And then, you know, all the things like the local bakery making werewolf cookies in the bars, um, <laughs> bringing up busloads of Illinois tourists and having silver bullet specials. You know, I mean, it was <laughs> awesome. It was, yeah, it was just, it was great at the time, you know, and I liked everybody having fun with it because I didn't know what it was. I, you know, I wasn't like, oh, I'm this serious researcher. You must not have fun with what I find, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that sometimes you hear, because I thought, well, you know, if anybody should profit from it, it should be the people of the town who have to put up with all this traffic and everything else that's going on. And the newspaper made a tidy sum selling uh, T-shirts using my illustration. So that was, you know, more power to them for that, too. So it was it was kind of a fun time. But that was what I wanted to really document in the book. And at that time, I really had even less clue than now as as to what the creature could have been. But I figured at the very, very least, it was at least folklore in the making. And how could I not want to document something like that? When, when you can see legends being born before your very eyes, that's something very special and unique. And I wanted to at least begin with that. That's That's really cool. I was going to ask you, is there? Are you going to be re-releasing an updated version of that book since there's still such a demand for it, and there's there's still all this money being fetched for it for for, for all the old copies and stuff? Have you thought about going back and updating it and re-releasing it as a centennial or an anniversary edition or something like that along the down the road? Well, that would have to be worked out with my publisher. So um, I'm I'm not sure what will happen there. At all, but and I and I hasten to add that I'm not receiving any of these large sums. Of money. <laughs> I wish oh, I had, wow. if, if I had known it would do that. You know, I would have kept a couple of boxes of uh, cases of books under my bed. I think I have a total of three copies to my name and oh, and no. have watermarks on them. You know, so it's the used bookstores who are really ending up um, the winners in 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 that thing. But no, I I was actually shocked when somebody called and pointed out one was going for like $149 on eBay, something like that, which right. is just crazy. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but um, I do hope that people will continue to um, buy the later sequels, which have completely different information, expanded theories and ideas, whatever I find. And those include, the, the second one was Hunting the American Werewolf, mm -hmm. which was um, the basis of the very first Monster Quest episode called American yep. Werewolf. I watched that. I waited for that. Oh, I, knew, I knew you were going to be involved with it. Yeah, I actually wrote the original script for that. Mm -hmm. It got changed a lot, you know, but I they did hire me to write the script. And I have associate producer credits because I did a lot of traveling and getting of witnesses and things like that. So that was a lot of fun to work on. Um, and then last year, I came out with a third one called The Michigan Dog Man, Werewolves, and Other Unknown Canines Across the U.S. Because each time one of these comes out, I get deluged with more mm -hmm. reports, more sightings. And I like to have them somewhere where they're in um, a you know, permanently researchable place. I don't put them all online because... What I have found over the years is that they tend to get immediately pirated. To, uh, really, um, either people get the facts wrong or they just kind of dilute it down or they expand it or they just diss it without really yeah, you know, taking I had care a, to look at it. I had a dogman sighting myself. Well, I, 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 I stutter from calling it a dogman or a werewolf sighting, but I had a sighting much longer when I was a child. I don't remember much of it. My family remembers it very, very well. Huh. And I was going to send it to you, but I never did. And because I, I kept my mouth shut about it for years and years, I never talked to anybody about it because I didn't want to be looked at as weird. Plus, I didn't, I didn't remember it. My family, my, my whole family related to me, but I uh -huh. didn't remember it. So I was like, well, I just never told the story. And that's like, once I got older and I kind of came out of my paranormal closet, so to speak, I finally <laughs> came out with it. I sent the story into another podcast. They run it on the air, but kept my name in anonymous and then eventually i sent it over to another paranormal blog and he embellished it a little bit and changed things a little bit which yeah. wasn't real bad i didn't mind a whole heck of a lot that he did it but he did kind of uh, we like to call it woo woo we can sensationalize a little bit and did a little bit of woo woo to it but i never ended up sending it to you in years after the for the longest time i was like man i really should have sent that to linda because shame she on you i can still send it to you yeah <laughs> i i yeah so. i would still very much like to have it because i am working on um, a fourth volume for Penguin Tarcher, 
And what they asked me to do was to take the best of the first three plus anything new and Mm. create a a fourth different book that still captures the whole thing and can give people in one big volume um, the essence of what I I tried to capture in in the first three. And that's going to be coming out next year. So, yeah, I would still very much like to have that. And the reason that I object to people adding and embellishing things beyond what the witness actually reports is that my other main reason for wanting to collect these stories is that I feel the only chance of ever understanding what this thing is is if I get a large enough database where I can compare and contrast, map things, um, document them as best I can, and sooner or later patterns will begin to emerge. And they already have, really. You know, it's kind of astounding to me. But but when you start playing with the facts, then that database is no longer trustworthy, and it can lead you down many wrong roads and really stifle any kind of research. That brings me to another question, sort of. Um, I was curious. It seemed like for a while you were trying to move away from the whole dog man werewolf thing because you were branching out and doing other things like Weird Michigan, um, your new book, for example. And I was wondering, um, which I guess I can tell, I guess I was wrong about it. I was wondering, uh, how are, are you comfortable with being known as the werewolf lady or as the go-to person <laughs> about werewolf and dog man phenomena? Well, go-to person is a little better than werewolf lady. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not offended by that because I can understand that it's a very handy shorthand for people. People, um, you know, and I—it's—it's it's all all done in good humor. I'm pretty sure, so that doesn't bother me. But um, yeah, I pretty much am the only person who's documenting this widespread number of reports over such a long period of time in permanent print that I know of. I mean, maybe there's someone else, you know, that I'm not aware of. And certainly other people, I know Nick Redford has written about the topic, and it's been included in other things. But um, I don't know of anyone who has amassed quite the pile of, of um, sightings and research that, that I have on, on this topic or that has published quite so much on it. So I guess I guess I would be the go-to person. Yeah, I think you've taken that topic and, and made it your own. I think you've owned it at this point. So, I, I got, you know, that's a pretty cool thing to have under your belt, I would assume, though. Well, you know, I always think, what would I like on my tombstone? She cleaned her house very well or she researched cryptids. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with the second one. I no, I, I, I came to it accidentally. I never set out. I always felt that someday I would write books, but I never thought that they would be about that topic, you know. And whether fate chose me to be the one to break that first story that got the ball rolling, or whether it was something that, uh, you know, a piece of a piece of me sought out and glommed onto because it happened to be there, I'll never know how that happened. But it. It does seem that I'm, I call myself the accidental werewolf chronicler because it, it happened and I was interested and it just blossomed. So, Did you have any interest in this topic at all or any, anything like the paranormal at all before you got into writing this or did it just literally just fall on your lap and you went with it? Oh, no, I, I, not, I wouldn't say in terms of werewolves, you know, I wasn't really very aware that people were seeing such a thing in modern times. You know, I, I don't think, um, Anybody was, really. Um, I was very interested in the UFO phenomenon. Um, My dad had been interested in it when he was, uh, he came from northern Wisconsin and he had an experience riding in the back of a pickup truck one night when uh, what he thought was a UFO, this huge bright light thing followed him in the pickup truck. And there have been other bigger sightings around that area since then. Or and and at the same time, so he was also a science fiction fan, and we always had all these sci-fi magazines around the house. You know, the old analogs, and mm-hmm. they always had the the pictures of aliens. And we also lived in a very old house that I'm quite sure was haunted. You know, it used to just terrify me, and so I was always trying to find out what these things were. And my family were Lutherans. I would ask my minister about it, and he wouldn't want to talk. So that, of course, made me go to the library and start looking things up. And I went through a period in my 20s where I actually said, okay, I'm just going to research this thing as best I can. And I went to um, whatever seminars and conferences. That was sort of in the dawning of the new age type of stuff that I kind of fell into and experienced some amazing things and um, decided that it was sort of a dangerous area to really get drawn in. I saw a lot of people having bad reactions to some of it and some really creepy stuff happening. 
So I had sort of put that aside. And by the time I was working at this newspaper, you know, I was married and and uh, raising a family at the same time. And those things were sort of on the back burner, but they were there. And my interest was there. And when people started saying they were seeing a werewolf around Elkhorn, Wisconsin, nobody else wanted to touch it. But I'm like, huh? Werewolf? Here? You know, yeah. We better yeah. investigate this. And at the time, my other thought was, I, I was kind of half having fun with it. You know, I was really sort of skeptical. But I thought, if there really is a large and dangerous unknown predator around this town, then people have a right to know that. And, of course, it was capped off with the local animal control officer having the manila file folder marked werewolf because people were calling him and calling it that. So, you know, that right away made it news. And then... Once you had that, you're off and running. It's on Inside Edition. Everybody's, um, you know, homing in on it. And it just was unstoppable from that point. That brings me to another question since you brought up uh, your past history with the paranormal. This is kind of an opinion question. How do you feel since I, I lovingly I, – this is a term of endearment, but you're old school. You come from, you come from the, like the, the way it was done before. How do you feel about how the investigation of the paranormal, like ghost hunting and things like that, is today as comparison as to what it was back when you first got into it? Do you, you know, how, what do you think about the way it's gone these days? Do you think it's a bad thing? It's a good thing? Do you think a lot of it gets pretty stupid or, you know, it's, is it over-sensationalized? Well, I, I know from my own experience with TV shows that it is over-sensationalized because you have to remember that any TV show on any paranormal topic is primarily entertainment. These are not informational documentaries. Yeah. And so, you know, anything that happens is going to be um, maximized and failures are minimized. Sometimes details are fudged. Um, even Monster Quest, which I thought generally did a very good job, only really had the budget to animate one creature for that first Monster Quest episode. So some of the incidents that are told on that show were actually very clearly Bigfoot. And if you read my book, it plainly states which ones they were. But they were all shown with the same sort of hybrid um, cartoon creature. I shouldn't say cartoon. It was it was an animated creature. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing it. It looked kind of hokey, actually. <laughs> yeah, because it was, it was really neither one nor the other, you know, yeah. and they kind of did that so they could include both. So you have to understand that, um, you know, it, you can't look at it as any kind of a real hard data type of thing when, when you're watching any of those shows. Um, on one hand, I think they're, it's good that they evoke more interest. On the other hand, um, I think it gives a lot of people this false sense of oh wow this is cool you know there's there's nothing dangerous about this look they're doing it on tv and then they go charging off uninformed and you know may have bad experiences or or nothing happens at all and they get disillusioned and, and quit one or the other yeah we talked i think it was our third episode we had an episode about the top three things that bug us about paranormal reality shows and we discussed a lot of that about how um it's become over sensationalized and a lot of kids and a lot of people think that since they watch the first two seasons of ghost hunters, that they can just go out and become paranormal investigators right. without really checking into the facts and the histories and things about what they're going into. Now I've also met a lot of people through Facebook and online that are involved with ghost hunting and paranormal investigating, and they have a good healthy amount of respect for what they're doing and they haven't bought into a lot of that. And no, like, to be honest, those are the only people that I really associate with or not to be snotty about it, but all the other people, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, moving on, you know? <laughs> well, so. it's, 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 it's healthier for yourself too, because, um, I, I can say that from what I've seen and experienced and witnessed myself, I know that there are things we don't understand. And whether you want to look at them from a religious aspect or if you just want to take the scientific tack that, hey, there are light wavelengths beyond uh, what our own eyes are tuned to receive. There are sounds both above and below our hearing range. We know that there are um, forces out there that our bodies just aren't built to actually normally receive and maybe there are things that exist in those in those uh light in, in those cycles that that we don't normally get but sometimes we do and it scares us so either way you look at it um i think it's hard to deny that there may be something else out there that's real and from my experience most of the time even if it appears benign at first the longer you toy with something 
um, probably the greater the chances are that it will not always remain benign. And I've, it's just from my own experience, other people may disagree, but it's, it's what I've seen. And so I think that any time that you go after anything that does not, um, you know, normally compute with our, with our ordinary world, that you have to have a great deal of respect and caution, and you owe it to yourself to educate yourself. Um, on these things very well before you start and then you're you're a lot safer That brings me to the other topic you had. You had written a book, which was really cool, and it wasn't really a paranormal book. It was just one of those really odd historical books, and that was the the book about the poison woman. Right, right, the poison widow. Poison widow. That's what it was. What what was that all about? Because we're also into we're also into really strange niche histories and things like that. Was that a book of fiction? Did that actually happen? Oh, this was complete nonfiction. I researched it for six years. I had like. 600 pages of court documents and uh, interviews with original witnesses. And this was an incident that happened in the early 1920s in Whitewater, Wisconsin, that I discovered by accident while researching something else for the newspaper and realized that nobody had ever written about it. It was just sort of buried because uh, the details of the trial, and there were actually two nationally publicized trials in those days, that were considered so sordid and shocking, those were the uh, words that the headlines kept using, that nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, They couldn't get women to serve on one of the juries because it was considered just something a woman shouldn't even think about because there was this um, lovely church-going petite lady in Whitewater whose husband was on the church council and sang in the choir. They had four lovely children, took in college student boarders, uh, from the what was then called the normal school, now it's UW Whitewater, and it turned out that she ended up having an affair with one of her male boarders, and between the two of them, they killed her husband with strychnine, which is a horrible, awful death, and then probably would have gotten away with it because no one could believe that she would have done such a thing, except then she tried to kill her four children with the same method. In, and even by hiding it in their, their candy, but she gave them these beautiful chocolate bonbons, uh, put them in someone else's car, sent them out for a drive and told them to eat the bonbons while they were on the way, thinking that the oldest one who was driving would crash the car and then the others would all um, just go into spasms and they that way they for sure, if some of them might have survived the crash, they for sure would die of the strychnine and it would all just be assumed that he crashed the car. That's gruesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, and, and I, my thoughts were, how could anybody from, you know, the, the background, she grew up on this little farm out in the prairie, church-going family, you know, how did she get to be like that? How, how can you do that to your family? And it just made me want to keep researching. And I finally even discovered that um, she con- she was just this consummate con woman. She conned her way out of prison. She had a whole second family that never knew what she did until I found them. They were in Illinois and said, basically, I know what your granny did last century. And, wow. <laughs> yeah, they, and they wouldn't believe me except I had the newspaper clippings, and they're like, yep, that's her. Wow. So uh, it was quite a thing, but yeah, it took me six years to research it, and that was actually my first book, and I had a feeling that it would be an easier sell. I knew that I wanted to write The Beast of Bray Road, but I had a feeling that true historical crime would be an easier sell than a book about werewolves, and I was I was right. You know, they I had no trouble um, pitching and selling that right away, and then they said, what else have you got? And I said, well, would, literally, I said, well, would you believe werewolves? <laughs> and they go, okay, try us. <laughs> so, That's because awesome. the Beast of Bray Road was was published not by you know the usual kind of publisher for that, but by um, Trails Media, which started out as a branch of Wisconsin Trails Magazine. So um, it was, but they published it under their history imprint. 
we, me and Lobo here, we're very much into Native American culture, Native American mythology and legends and so forth. And to my knowledge, uh, from a Native American culture, werewolves are traditionally viewed as, as protectors of the spirit world and protectors of nature. Have you spoken to any Native Americans about the research that you do, and what have they told you? I've heard I've heard you make mention of it on other shows, but it always seems like somebody cuts you off or they try to steer you back into you know the romanticism, you know the, the diehard werewolf stuff, and they always seem to tear you away from it. And I've always wanted to hear your opinions because I, I believe you've talked to Native Americans, and I've always been curious about what have they told you about what you're investigating. Yeah, I I have. I've talked to people from various uh, nations across the country, and I don't know um, if I would say that they they view them quite as benignly as as you've said. Some some of them think of them, as, and there are different forms, also. Um, yeah, I know have, skinwalkers are viewed as as pretty much an evil entity. Right, and that's one form where it's something that's conjured up by. A medicine man that has gone down the wrong path. They might use the word witch, you know, which doesn't mean the same thing as like our modern Wiccans. Yes. But but that's a word that they often use to describe them. And these are conjured beings that are either conjured up around the medicine person, him him or herself, kind of like a a werewolf suit, if you will, a psychic werewolf suit, or um, a separate solid entity that then goes out and does the bidding, which is never good. You know, they're always out to do bad things. And it's not just wolves. There are also things called bear walkers. Um, other traditions call them skin, ch- the, the Canadian Cree call them um, skin changers. Mm-hmm. So there are variations of it, but that's one type. Then there's another type that um, regards them as spirit guardians, Here which you go. might be another sort of, of um, conjured thing that is not really there so much to guard nature, but is to guard sacred places like ancient burial grounds, sacred springs, that sort of thing. And there are um, at, there's at least one there's one man that I've interviewed uh, David Wax's bear he is a conservation warden in Michigan and he believes that the uh, dog soldiers um, that have fought in every major U.S. war since oh and I can't think of the date right offhand but I think that I think it's at least six of them um, and their idea was that um, they would they they held the the dog is in very high regard for its fighting ability. They would stake themselves to the ground in a battle, and then that meant that they were either there to fight until they died or conquered their enemy, one or the other. And it was believed that if they died this way, then they could come back as the spirit of a of a powerful canine and take over guardianship uh, duties for their people. And mm, okay. David Wax's bear really believes that all of these dogmen at least in Michigan, probably are the spirits of these um, dog soldiers. But then there's this one other view that probably is the majority of the people that I've talked to all have some version of this, which is that both the Bigfoot and the Dog Man are very, very ancient spirit creatures that um, were here before man. They have some ancient business that forbids them from actually killing and eating people which is why time after time after time in the hundreds of reports I've seen, nobody's ever, they, they feel they're going to be eaten, but they never are, um, and that they can live in both the spirit world or what we might call another dimension or our world or this dimension, and they can go back and forth between them. While they're here, they're entirely corporeal most of the time. They require um, protein and that sort of thing to feed upon in order to have energy and sometimes human emotion, which might explain very well why they seem interested in frightening people and then running away, um, because otherwise that's hard to explain. So actually, what they describe fits the database. Uh, that that paradigm actually fits the, the large volume of facts the best um, of any, but different variations on that are, are what I've really heard. And something that I discovered that's documented in Hunting the American Werewolf, and that really astonished me, and that finally got me an interview 
with uh, one of the top Ho Chunk elders and and uh, art anthropologists is the fact that I was studying. Wisconsin's ancient animal effigy mounds. Now, Wisconsin has somewhere in the 90th percentile of all of the ancient animal-shaped effigy mounds in the world. Yeah. There's the Ohio Serpent Mound. You know, there's um, a few that extend into the bordering states. But other than that, Wisconsin really has them, which is weird. And Wisconsin also happens to be the locus of these. uh, There really are more from Wisconsin, although they are completely spread across the United States. Wisconsin does sort of seem to be the locus. And I was looking at this book that had come out with a map of different types of the animal effigy mounds. And it struck me that one certain type um, that settlers called the lizard mound because of its long tail, but which actually would be better translated as, as uh, spirit water spirit mounds, almost exactly coincided with hot spots of man wolf or dog man sightings. And I made a map of that and overlaid them in they were just perfect it was unbelievable wow. i've showed that at conferences and people's jaws just drop the maps got left off the book because of space considerations but they are on my oh, beast of Bray Road.com awesome. website you can you can find them on beast of Bray Road.com somewhere i'll go um, and check that out yeah so they're still there so when i made that discovery um they immediately let me have an appointment because they're very interested in, they don't really know for sure what those mounds are either. They believe it was their ancestors who made them, um, but they're eagerly investigating them, you know, as much as any other um, archaeologists are. And so this was very interesting news to them. Wow. So there's, yeah, it, it, and I learned some things that they wouldn't let me tell, unfortunately. But. Oh, that's fine. You know, <laughs> that's, you know say yeah, what you I can say, a- that's fine. I had a question for you. Uh, sure. You uh, you you had an interview on Erie Radio some years back, and uh, I wrote in after your interview because while you were describing the interview, I about fell out of my chair. Um, I there's a few people that are involved with me, and I've I've had this for ever since I was about three or four years old. I have a guide that I have been seeing since I was three or four. I had an initial animal, that animal left, and another one came in its place. And I was told by the first one that it was leaving, but another one would come in its place. And the animal that showed up is the definitive description of one of your beasts, the Beast of Bray Road. Really? I almost fell out of my chair. My wife actually caught a glimpse of it while we were dating and asked me why it was there. You're kidding. No. Whoa, that's solid. It was, it's, it's been... It's been in my family. It's that's where my name comes from. That's where I took it from, Lobo. Mm. It was just it's it. The description. It was about it, the things when it first showed up. When I first saw it, and I for the life of me, I don't know why I wasn't terrified, because where I was, I lived in a Victorian house, and the window that it came to to talk to me the first time had to be a good eight feet off the ground, mm-hmm. and. I was not terrified for any reason. I was about four at the time, and I have seen it. Your story ever, sounds ever a lot like my story. <laughs> yeah. I have wow. seen it ever since, and now it only comes around to tell me when something bad is going to happen, when there's a death in the family or something's going to show up that's unexpected. Kind of a harbinger of doom. Well, you know, um, the great majority of sightings reports I get depict things that behave unusually but that aren't out of the realm of physical possibility. However, Mm. there's a second category. And in that category, it sounds an awful lot like what you've described. People, either as children or starting as teenagers or young adults, usually will see these wolf-like creatures. Sometimes they're standing in their room. Um, I've been corresponding with an extremely highly educated woman. She has a doctorate um, at a southern university who has been seeing these creatures in her room for years. And they just God, I'm not crazy. Thank God. (laughs) No, no, you're not. Well, I'll I'll tell you what. If you are, you're not the only one. Excellent. (laughs) So, and they vary. You know, some people are afraid of them. Some people aren't. Some feel that they're there to give them messages. Other people Mm. feel that they don't know why they're there. Um, some one man walked out of his bathroom in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, one morning, and encountered it standing right there, 
in front of him. He looked around to get a baseball bat to hit it with, and the thing just evaporated. Wow. But not before. He saw, it was very solid. You know, he was so sure that it was a real creature that he was going to try and club it before nice. it got him. It, it, was, it was that close, but he didn't. It, it left before he got the chance to try it. Wow. But that that's a category that I really haven't figured out. All I know is that there there do seem to be a certain number of sightings where creatures appear, usually in the person's bedroom, not always. Um, and then there's also another aspect of some of the more mundane sightings. I've had one of these ongoing in Wisconsin and one ongoing in Ohio. In fact, um, the woman in Ohio, in Ohio is making a diary of it. Wow. Um, it's been going on for two years where after an initial sighting, they seem to have this continuing manifestation where things will be crashing against the house at night. They'll find the siding mm. dented like seven feet off the ground. They'll right. find they'll find footprints that are too big to be made by an ordinary animal, but they're usually just not real clear or identifiable. Right. And it continues often for years. And there's no real way to stop it. Um, I have noticed that some people seem to get some relief by having religious ceremonies, either um, you know the Native American style of, of uh, cleansing with sage or good old-fashioned um, spirit exorcisms, that kind of thing, prayer, prayer vigils. Um, but what I usually recommend to people is that they get a whole big set of floodlights that they can switch on from inside their house and start turning them on every time anything happens. And that often greatly reduces the severity. Mm. But we're not talking about things that natural animals do. You know, right. if you see a wolf or a bear or something like that once or twice, it's not hanging around your house, bashing no, they in want siding, out. peeping into your windows. Um, it, and these things are seen not only from the inside peeping into windows, but people have witnessed them peeping from the outside. One of the creepiest happened in Decatur, Illinois, where this couple was looking, got, just was drawn to look out their window one night and saw four upright wolf-like creatures walking silently down the street. They watched stunned as it went to a neighbor's house. <laughs> just casually hanging out down the road. <laughs> yeah, and then they swarmed this neighbor's house. They started crawling all over it, crawled up on the roof, hung down, looked in the windows. It was as That's if they awesome. were examining it from every angle and then finally got down and went off into the night. Well, See, that's, you know. See, that's the thing. When this 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 particular, it's my guide. I can't. There's no other way to describe it. And this thing is massive, and it's just I never feel afraid of it, ever. I've actually been mm -hmm. in areas that that I had uh, a bad feeling about, and sure enough, there it is. And it's whatever was whatever was giving me the vibe before. As soon as it came up, was gone. Well, you know, there is some very benign precedent for this. There was um, one saint um, from England, and I can't think of his name right now, and he lived several hundred years ago, but he was always accompanied by this great gray dog, mm. and he would be walking along and be in a dangerous area, and the dog would suddenly appear. It would walk with him until he was past the danger. Um, it would sometimes follow him into houses and sleep at his feet. It was never seen to eat anything, mm -hmm. you know, like normal dogs are normally just slathering at the mouth for, you know, anything they could get. This this dog was above that, and it was sort of like his angelic guide that, that accompanied him and was considered part of his um, holy regiment. That reminds me of a story, the uh, a Native American story. When Americans first came to the country, they would um, they would talk about how they would be in the winter time. They would be getting pulled by horse drawn sleighs, and they would look out and they would see wolves running along them in the distance, and they would be fearful of it. And they would tell the Native Americans about it, and the Native Americans would be like, "No, those wolves are there to protect you. They're not there to try to consume you or hunt you. That's not what they're doing. They're there to protect you and guide your way across." But it was never perceived that way, I guess, because no. of uh, Christianity and things at the time. Well, you know, I don't know if it's so much as Christianity as the fact that Europe did used to be overrun by wolves. Mm. Um, it was very heavily forested up until the past, you know, a few hundred years ago. And people had to learn to live with wolves. And, and there was wolf, because the wolves and the people lived so closely together, there was a lot of depredation where the wolves would start out getting livestock and, 
and, and children, and, uh, yeah. And then children. And then you had um, big legends like the Beast of Gévaudan, the French. Oh, you know, yeah. The Beast the, of Gévaudan. Yeah, exactly. That, um, you know, was said to have killed so many people. And the, See, they the still don't know what that those, is, though. No, there's a theory that it was a hyena owned by a count or something like yep. that, but it, it, and it's not nothing. Nobody's been able to prove it really True. what it was. However, all of these, the Jean Grenier, um, all these other. Um, that was what the movie Peter Brotherhood Stubbe. of the Wolf was based on, I think. Right, yep. right, and then the German guy Peter Stubbe. Um, there's a lot of different pronunciations of his last name, but the thing was, whatever these things were, and some of them were demented people, some were actual wolves, some we don't know, they were all killing people. There were bodies. Mm-hmm. There was slaughter with all of these present-day contemporary sightings, and it's not just in the United States. It's in, it's in Europe, too. Um, nobody's dying. You know, right. there aren't missing people. There aren't bodies. Um, nobody's even reporting being hurt. People think People have been out in the open, been chased at close range, close enough that they could feel the creature's breath, and then just when they think it's going to get them, it runs into the cornfield. Nice. You know, and then they're left, they're left, you know, just wondering how they ever escaped their doom. And that has happened more than once. So there's a big difference between these things. But I, I think that people who came to the United States as, as settlers, these Europeans, carried with them this sort of... Um, long-standing fear of wolves that had existed just because of the way that um you know they're 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 clashing with with the with the wolf packs was, was happening yeah. and, and causing all of these things to to occur see they're still in the united states as far as i know outside of hybrids there has never been a person killed by a wolf a true wolf in the united states however we're sort of approaching that same state that europe was where mm. We're taking away their habitat, yep. and not only wolves but bears. Black bears have started, you know. Oh, yeah. They used to say yeah. that about black bears, and black bears have started. Coyotes too, and coyotes because yep. they're getting too used to humans. They're they again they start with uh, preying on livestock and then progress mm-hmm. to people. They lose their fear of humans, and because we're mixing it up more than we used to. They used to have yeah. their space, we had ours, and you're starting to see more of that. It's the same process repeated. Yeah, um, I've had my own close encounters with coyotes too. I've I've been camping and opened up a tent, and they're literally right in front of me. And oh, wow. at the time, the only thing I could think of was to do. I was camping with my buddies, and the only thing I could think of to do was to growl really loudly to scare them off. I'm like. Right. Uh, I open up. There's a pack of coyotes. Well, that's probably about four of them sitting there. I heard. I heard them outside. Where I thought it was a dog. I open up the tent, and there's coyotes there. And I'm like, ah, you know. And my buddy heard me, and he's like, "You're a drunk idiot. What are you doing?" And I'm like, "There's coyotes <laughs> out here." It's like, no, there's not. And he goes. By the time he got out, got out to where I was, the coyotes were gone. But the next morning, we found the tracks all over the place, and they had gotten into our garbage and drug it all over. But sure. you know, we were in a we were in a somewhat populated area at the time. So I wasn't afraid or intimidated, but the only thing I could think of was to do was like I would growl, just growl very loudly and make noise and try to scare them off. And all my buddies, I know, I know they're listening right now, are laughing at this because they were there. But I, they were like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Coyotes, you know, here, right here." <laughs> they're small, we have one but down in the a street. pack, yeah, in a pack, you you know, they can do some damage, and, oh, and yeah. they, you have to be careful. I was once on an overnight stakeout, and. Um, we happened to turn the floodlight on just in time to catch a pack of them heading silently toward us. Dope. <laughs> oh, that's not good. No, no. Hey, guys, play it cool. Everybody do. turn around and walk away. <laughs> See, yeah. I, you, you got to realize that uh, coyotes are wild animals, just they like are. any other wild animal. And the thing that frightens me the most is um, I used to spend time on Boone, North Carolina, and they have koi dogs, which are just mm-hmm. domesticated dogs that have just gone. And they oh, used to cause... Red. All kinds of problems. I mean, there were things being killed, stuff being ripped apart, right. and they're right. just nah. They were killing coyote packs, and it's sure. just I'm like, I'd be more afraid of a group of those, you know, because they used to know what people were, and they, and, you know, I don't want to say innately hate them, but you know, you were turned loose and left on your own. You're not going to really think highly of man. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, originally I thought that the Beast of Bray Road might have been like a wolf hybrid with something say like a russian wolfhound you know yeah, they, get big. they get, they get big. big they've got that shaggy fur you you breed it with a, a wolf and you might get something really weird but it doesn't it still doesn't explain why it walked upright and yeah, also no, the bipedal it, motion and also you would have to have the exact same hybrid occurring mm. all over the united states 
going back to say nineteen the nineteen thirties, right? And that just seems unlikely. It's not. It's not going to happen. You're going to have degeneration as the as as the breed goes down, right, especially exactly. if it's if you have a breeding population and there were there were they were wool in the unlikelihood of a you know um, a wolfhound and a wolf actually. Even a wolfhound or a wolf and like a St. Bernard or a, or a Doberman or anything, a Marmaduke, you're going to get a large <laughs> animal at first, but right. there's, there's going to be other wild wolves in the area. And if they interbreed, it's going to go back down to the original size of what right. yeah, they the wild to, animal was. Yeah, they revert to type after a while. The animal's yeah. characteristics usually get bred out. Mm, which is a shame because some of the hybrids are beautiful, but... Yeah, it, it, and you know, it's weird because my own little Lhasa Apso, um, the Lhasa Apsos are one of the closest to a wolf genetically mm. of all the modern right. dog breeds, which is hard to believe. when you Well, look not at really because their bloodline's been kept pretty clean. It's been kept clean and it's also one of the oldest um, first bred dogs. You know, they go back way farther than, than many other um, of our modern dog breeds that that we would consider looking more like a wolf, but really the the Lassa. and that's why I think they think they're they still think they're wolves. You know, they act right. like it. <laughs> yeah, you want the background there? It sounds pretty cute. You can hear him every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, he pipes up. He's he he takes good care to guard me from everything, chipmunks, moles, you know, whatever. Well, we've got you for a couple of more minutes here, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a few more questions, and then we're going to let you go. Uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, touch briefly on is you do a, apparently a lot of work with Wisconsin Bigfoots and doing a lot of this investigation with that. Well, I do because for a couple of reasons. One is that people report them to me, and I feel obligated to keep track of that. The other is that I feel it's important to know what other things may be around you know, and to distinguish between the two, you know, to make sure we're always talking about different creatures. Most of the time we are, but um, there's a certain swath of territory, because I always map these things out when I, when I get them, where since 1960, I have 12 pretty good sightings of what are definitely Bigfoot-like creatures, not the Dogman one. They occur, too, very close and adjacent, mostly. But it's almost like They've carved out these territories for themselves that are adjacent, but sort of utilizing the same basic corridor of this um, big nature preserve that runs through southeastern Wisconsin. Um, but I think it's sort of astonishing to have this uh, dozen or so. The most recent was just last summer. Wow. And last somebody summer. had a yeah, and somebody had a daylight sighting of one disappear walking into a tree line. Um, so she saw it very well because it was daylight and she was able to pull over on the highway and get a, a really a pretty close look at it. Um, she actually was going to jump out of her car except she had her grandchild in the back seat. <laughs> Didn't think she better leave it alone in the car on the highway. Right. So, uh, But she was just so astounded and she said there was absolutely nothing else that it could have been. You know, it was just classic. And this was, you know, on a July day, um, there's nobody going to be walking around in a nine-foot Bigfoot suit, you know, just to walk into the Yeah, tree. just out in the woods, hanging out, walking around a bare, you know, Bigfoot suit. a good suit. way to get oh, shot. Great way yeah, to get exactly, shot. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And normally if somebody's, you know, spoofing, they'll jump out of out of the cornfield and yell boo or, you know, this thing was just trying to slip into the trees and, and remain on scene, but she saw it. Now, when I went back and looked that up, I discovered that it was almost exactly on the spot of an ancient Native American mound. Wow. And so was another one that happened uh, kind of in that vicinity. A guy was fishing on the Bark River nearby and saw one standing on the banks looking at him. Hmm. Yeah. That's a bit disheartening. Yeah, it sounds again like yeah. a spirit guardian situation again. But, you know, here they are in southeastern Wisconsin. It's not really wilderness here, you know. We're, yeah, it's we, water parks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying exactly. to cool off. It's Kalahari exactly. Resort. Yeah, we're, an half, we're an hour and a half from, from Wisconsin Dells, an hour from Madison, an hour from Milwaukee, two hours from Chicago. And yet I've got this slice of, of 12 pretty good reports. And then I'll see all this fuss made over somebody, you know, catching a glimpse somewhere and, you know, flocks of Bigfoot hunters come and knock on all the trees. And here I've got this pretty good body of, of reports. Just And that's not counting all the other ones all over Wisconsin. This is just in a very concentrated area over the past 30 years or so, which I think is, is rather remarkable. Um, but it does show me that 
people are seeing both kinds of things. And most of the time, when they when they're able to see the whole creature, you know, when it's not just a glimpse of some dark fur, when they see the feet and the head and the legs, they're quite sure as to whether they saw a Bigfoot or a dog man, you know, because the two are very quite distinct and different. Right. Well, tell us about tell us about your new book that you've got just recently, which was Monsters of Wisconsin, and if you've got anything else in the works coming up. Well, Monsters of Wisconsin came out in July of this year, and the new one that's coming out next year is going to be called Real Wolfman, True Encounters in Modern America. Penguin Tarcher is bringing that out, and that, again, will combine my first several books, The Beast of Bray Road, Hunting the American Werewolf, and um, the Michigan Dogman, Werewolves, and Other Unknown Canines. And uh, you can find me on Twitter and MySpace. If you go to beastofbray, B-R-A-Y, road.com, beastofbrayroad.com, you can find the links to all the places that I update frequently. That site has gone a little static. I'm going to be transferring it over to something else very shortly. But it still has the frequently asked questions, all of those links, and some old logs that aren't, anywhere else that people might be interested in digging into cool cool as well as a book page is that also where you announce all of your upcoming projects and books and things um when i get to it i don't keep i try and keep up a schedule calendar on there as best as i as i can um i also have a myspace blog where i really uh i've had kind of a really cool sighting that i just posted on there you can find the link to that on beastofbrayroad.com um, I'm trying to consolidate it all in one space under lindagodfrey.com, but I, I'm so busy. I was going to say, a lot of people aren't using MySpace that much anymore from what I gather. No, no. I I do have Facebook pages, Twitter, and you can find all those links on beastofbrayroad.com. Cool. Cool. Well, Linda, we'll thank you. put a link you. in the show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well we, we were going to do that regardless anyhow. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, we've been we've been hyping this up for, for a while now, so... It's uh, we're definitely going to be covering you on there. We're, I'm going to put a permalink up on our site as well um, in the Great, friends thanks. of the show and links area. We'll put a, a link to your site. And if you have anything in the future you want to come back on the show for, don't hesitate in Please. the instant to get a hold of us because we could easily talk to you for another three hours, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, and anytime, just give me a call and I'll be glad to come on. If you lose a guest and you need a quick quick refill you know i'm, I'm here so, so you're not you're not someone who would be in my opinion and i'm sure ro feels the same way you are not a refill guest <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're a premier guest That's absolutely oh thanks absolutely. i appreciate that well i like to get the message out and i'm always uh, always glad to talk so well, thank you very much for coming on, Linda. We very much appreciate you coming on here. This is this is great. We've gotten to talk to one of our heroes, absolutely. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. It's you've you've talked to us about stuff that we've always wanted to know tonight, and you've delivered the information, which was exactly the kind of stuff that we were looking for. Mm-hmm. Great, it was my pleasure. Thank, thank you very so much. much. Take care. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was awesome. Well, Linda, we thanked you a million times. If you happen to hear this episode, thank you once again for coming on. Um, I can't wait to talk to her again sometime. I look forward to it. Well, folks, that was Linda Godfrey. So uh, hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> I know I did. We've got one more guest in the can to put on here. We're going to try to get him on. You're going out of town next week. So yep, I am. There is the potential that we may not have an episode after this one. We may be taking a week off just because you're going to be going out of town for a week. Right. But, hey, people, thus far we've given you everything you paid for. So you know, <laughs> I think we're allowed to take a day off every once in a while. We're going to try not to. We're, we're going to try to see if we can get Jeremy on here, Jeremy Vaney on here before that. Right. And um, I've talked with him, and we're going to talk about with him when he comes on the show – um, the world of ufology, um, the goods, the bads, um, you know, how to get involved with it, what to do, what not to do, and just, you know, a little bit of his background about ufology and so forth. Right. So we're going to try to get him on this week and we're going to try to have that episode up while you're down in, in, uh, Indiana or Pennsylvania, is it Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania, Indiana. Indiana. It's Indiana. Indiana. That's right. 
Um, if not, well, we just won't have an episode that week. I'll throw a reminder up on the feed to let everybody know that we're not going to have an episode that week. Right. But um, that's it for this show, I think. I think we're uh, pretty much done with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think we're going to have any Easter eggs in this week. We might not. I wouldn't expect her to be Easter eggs because we didn't oh. really have any screw-ups. <laughs> well, before we got her online, we did. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. We, didn't, we don't have any English segments this week. No, not this uh, not this week. But who knows? Listen, listen to where you listen to where the Easter eggs usually are at that point. Maybe I can throw something in there. Maybe right. I can pick something up. Yeah, but you, uh, don't take it out of our archives. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got plans for those. Oh, yeah, right. Well, folks, this has been Rojan. And this is Lobo. Peace True out. Better Connecticut. I got it in first. Ah! Win. Uh-huh. <laughs> nice. Peace out, people. Peace.
He's totally gay. Hey, don't look at me. Hold on. Yo. Yeah. No, hold on. Oh, like, hold on to the. <laughs> and we're walking, walking, and scene. <laughs> Boop.